Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we will be exploring science and pseudoscience on the internet. My guest is Craig Weiler. He is a parapsychological journalist and the author of The Weiler Psy, which is a blog on the internet. He is also author of Psy Wars, TED, Wikipedia, and The Battle for the Internet. This is an internet interview, and I'll switch over now to the internet video. Hello, Craig. It's a pleasure to connect with you. I think you've written a very important book about the controversies that uh, have have been raging on on the internet. I have uh, run into them, and just about everybody I know in the field of parapsychology has has had to deal with this army of uh, skeptical Boy Scout types of of people who try to uh, delete. Uh, important information regarding the findings of parapsychology. Uh, I thought the best way to focus on our conversation would be to uh, dig into the issue of distinguishing between science and pseudoscience. Uh, uh, can we start there? What are your thoughts on that? Well, in terms of the difference between science and pseudoscience, this is actually kind of clear cut. With, with science, what we have is you do an experiment, it gets peer-reviewed, it gets published, bam, science. And with pseudoscience, that's a little bit more murky because what are we talking about when it comes to pseudoscience? I've, I've never been completely clear on that one. For example, astrology isn't really a science, so it isn't really, uh, you know, pseudoscience because it never claimed to be science in the first place. It claims knowledge from a different source. They don't do peer-reviewed scientific papers. And then you have stuff like tobacco health studies, which are definitely pseudoscience. And the reason you know this is because you have other science that backs up the fact that these people have lied about their findings. That's probably a more clear-cut view of pseudoscience. It's a vague title, and I have a lot of problems with using it, and I don't normally uh, throw that term out myself because I'm I'm not comfortable with how that, that how that's used. The term typically is used by people who feel that they are scientific and they have to defend themselves against pseudoscience, which I suppose uh, is really the source of a, a lot of uh, what you write about. People claiming science on their side. I've I've had a chance to talk to probably hundreds of them over the years. I mean, I've been doing this since 2008. And my experience is, is that there's, their idea of science isn't really what science is. Uh, they, they tend to be into their talking points as opposed to getting down in the weeds. And with skeptics, there's, there's no arguing with that kind of stuff. I mean, if you're talking about a scientific argument, you're talking about taking facts and interpreting the meaning of them, not having an argument about whether something's a fact or not. This is something I encounter a lot of. I know one of the big areas uh, th that uh, people who consider themselves scientific are very upset with is, is uh, what they call medical quackery. And that could range from hypnosis to chiropractic to uh, various um, rivalries, one might say, amongst different uh, professions in, in the healthcare field. I've seen a lot of that. And in fact, if you go on to Wikipedia and you look up pseudosciences, you'll find a lot of holistic health practices there, including chiropractic care. I have no idea why they seem to be on a, on a roll against chiropractic care. You can find a chiropractor on every corner that insurance pays for them. They're, they have schools, they're medically sound. I don't know what their problem is there. Uh, but if I had to guess, I'd say that uh, when you're talking about homeopathy and chiropractic care and naturopathy and this whole string of holistic medicines, the key is the holistic part. That's something that they don't appear to be able to wrap their heads around. 
I have had discussions with them and it just goes round and round and round. They just, I don't have any credibility as far as they're concerned. So we don't really have a discussion, but it's really clear that when it comes to practices that require seeing things as a whole, this seems to be where skeptics fall short. And that includes psychic ability. One of the areas uh, where it, it seems that there's a, a raging controversy that you focus on is anything having to do with the nature of consciousness itself. It's, you know, in science and academia, consciousness is acknowledged as one of the biggest mysteries. And, and yet you have a, a sense on the internet that there are some people who, who have very set ideas about consciousness. And if anybody uh, challenges their point of view, uh, that person is considered unscientific. I've seen a lot of that. I've had discussions about consciousness on the internet myself, and that's been my experience as well. I think the key here is to look at how they're looking at the argument, what they're seeing. And the thing that, the thing that always jumps out at me is that, is that they see this in very black and white terms. In other words, materialism is the philosophy. I mean, that's the truth, is materialism to them. So what they're doing is they're wrapping all their arguments and thoughts around the idea that they have to support materialism. There is no gray area. There is no ambiguity for them. So they don't see this as a process of discovery. They see this as defending a particular point of view. And that's something I think Sheldrake has pointed out really, really well in his book, The Science Delusion, that you have these people that are not listening. They're not comprehending enough that there might be another way of looking at it, and you can't communicate that to them at all. Since you've brought up Rupert Sheldrake, uh, a person who I've had the privilege of interviewing several times in the original Thinking Aloud series going back more than 20 years ago, uh, he really... Uh, got himself embroiled in a major controversy, uh, I think seven or eight years ago, maybe longer, uh, when he gave a TED talk about the nature of science itself. It, it caused a huge uproar that you've written about. Yeah, that was in 2013. I know it seems like a lot longer, uh, but it, it was, it was a 2013. Uh, I had the good fortune to, to be in on that a uh, whole discussion when it first began and to follow it all the way to its conclusion, which was a year later. And to a certain extent, it was hilarious to watch because the uh, Ted began with the assumption that psychic ability is a pseudoscience, there's nothing to it, the skeptics are right, and that there's really no evidence to support the kind of things that Sheldrake does. So they listen to these skeptics, and this would be like on a Reddit thread or uh, different, uh, different skeptics that they paid attention to, uh, PZ Myers and a few others. And so they had this one idea about how things were, and they thought they could open this all up to discussion kill all the dissent with superior arguments and call it a day and take the videos offline. Well, it didn't work out that way. As soon as they got into it, they were absolutely overwhelmed with comments supporting Sheldrake. And some of these were from quite the intellectuals, uh, Brian Josephson, Nobel Prize winner, um, uh, Eisenstein, I can't remember his first name, uh, and a few others, uh, just really high level intellectuals jumped in on the argument and when you looked at the comment sections and the threads and how they were going, the skeptics were getting absolutely destroyed and were really resorting to personal attacks and anger and other things out of frustration. Ted didn't know what to do about this, so they kept the discussion going, perhaps hoping for a Hail Mary from a skeptic that would, that would help them. They, they hired a science panel to look into the videos and to provide a uh, critique of them. That critique turned out to be terrible. Sheldrake and Hancock both shot that thing down uh, almost the moment it was up and, and Ted had to cross it out. 
Then TED decided to double down and they took out one of their TEDx programs down in Hollywood, which created more uproar. And the upshot of all of this was that a relatively minor video by Sheldrake, which had garnered maybe 35,000 views, vaulted to 5 million. I mean, it just, it was completely the opposite effect of what Ted wanted. And uh, the result of it was that they basically have bad publicity that they're stuck with forever. That, that's basically how that played out. You also mentioned Graham Hancock, uh, who was involved in this uh, controversy. Hancock is a uh, popular uh, journalist of uh, concerning uh, various uh, mysteries in the field of archaeology. His work is somewhat controversial, but I gather that he got the same treatment as Rupert Sheldrake, which is that he, he gave a presentation at a TED Talk, and uh, the video was put online like Sheldrake's and then taken down again. Yeah, that's right. It was The, the, the treatment was nearly identical to Rupert Sheldrake's. So Graham Hancock is controversial because he is providing evidence that civilization is much, much older than the current theories hold. And he's provided some evidence for this. And for his troubles uh, and for his careful research, he's been branded a pseudo-archaeologist. Uh, I, I, it's not really a field I follow, so I don't have any way to, um, to vet him or, or say either way what, what his work is like. But... Um, my guess is, is that like Sheldrake, he's exploring the edges and he should be uh, complimented on, 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 on taking a path that few people are looking at and exploring. In the case of uh, both Rupert Sheldrake and Graham Hancock, uh, if I understand correctly from your book, when they gave these TED Talks, they weren't really trying to promote some of their more controversial ideas. They were instead talking about the process by which science itself is conducted. Isn't, isn't that correct? Uh, Graham Hancock, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of his speech. It's, I'm drawing a blank at this moment, but this was basically uh, on the nature of, um, it was on the nature of consciousness, and it had to do with uh, with the way it's perceived in the, uh, in establishment terms, that if you're, when you're talking about psychedelic drugs, these are considered uh, forbidden, uh, even though that some of, even though some of them have health benefits. Uh, he talked about his own experiences with marijuana, and how that had been damaging to him. And somehow that talk became terribly controversial as well. Um, if you saw how Ted, if you looked at the Ted criticisms of these talks, they, they bore no relation to the talks themselves. It was as if these people were pulling criticisms out of thin air. So I don't really know what the people at Ted thought they were seeing, but what I was seeing looked pretty ordinary and non-controversial. In other words, the uh, suggestion seems to be that because uh, in other forums, these particular individuals, Sheldrake and, and Graham Hancock, were um, espousing ideas uh, based on various empirical findings, as a matter of fact, that were not yet accepted by the scientific mainstream. There was a, a group of skeptics, including some university professors and people with credentials who felt that uh, they they should be eliminated from the TED forum, that their very presence in a uh, video sponsored by this organization, TED, about which I know very little, actually, uh, would, would be a disgrace to the organization itself. And they put pressure on the organization to remove the videos. And then that had the opposite effect. The videos, uh, having been removed, uh, got reposted somewhere else and became far more popular. And the reputation of Ted was besmirched because of this, because of the apparent censorship. Well, yeah, Ted is supposedly about exploring new ideas. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's part of the whole thing. And so the idea of exploring new ideas and then squashing new ideas, those two things don't jive very well, as you can well imagine. Uh, I really got the impression, as you, as you alluded to here, 
that Sheldrake and Hancock weren't being condemned for their presentations so much as for what they stood for and and who they were and, and the whole controversy around them. And yes, when you're talking about the skeptics that are trying to defend science, that is totally a thing. It's it's part of their, I don't want to say religious beliefs because that's kind of an insult to all these atheists, but it's it's definitely a zealot, a zealot type thing for them. Of They are defending science from irrationality and irrational people and protecting science against the creep of pseudoscience and quackery. This is their thing. This is their mission statement, and this is what they go for. And, and you can see that in the background of the TED controversy. Now, another figure who has gotten caught up in all of this is my good friend Russell Targ, who did uh, very important research and remote viewing funded by the United States government done at SRI International, a major uh, military industrial think tank published in scientific journals. Uh, uh, he also did a TED talk about his research, uh, and his TED Talk was removed and uh, subsequently has been viewed millions of times on the internet. I haven't seen the banned TED Talk from him, but I, I was down in LA for the ex-TEDx uh, Hollywood one, because after TED uh, took away the license for TEDx Hollywood, uh, the promoter, uh, uh, Suzanne, uh, put it on anyway at her own expense, and and he was one of the speakers. And Russell Targ gave an absolutely phenomenal speech there. Um, you know, in, in person, he's a really serious guy, and you know, he's, he has a very academic tone. And he got up on stage and he just shined. The guy uh, does an incredible job of presenting, and. Uh, he's got a wealth of information. His ideas were really clear, and he's a joy to watch. So I'm not surprised that his video has done really well. Well, you mentioned Suzanne Taylor, who is a, a person I know, and uh, apparently she had the franchise to operate TEDx talks in uh, West Hollywood. And because she has uh, leanings that displeased other people, they took her franchise away from her. Uh, and you write about that as well. Yes. She'd spent a great deal of time uh, getting her license from Ted and getting all of her speakers vetted. But when the controversy occurred, uh, they just threw her right smack under that bus and, and took away the license, uh, right, right as she was getting ready to, to put this conference on. We're talking like maybe a month out. Uh, I don't think it was a very good idea on Ted's part. Uh, first of all, she had the conference anyway, and it was advertised as X Ted X, uh, another banned conference, you know, another bunch of banned speeches, uh, which do relatively well on the internet. And, you know, just in general, it was, um, it was, it was kind of a dick move. <laughs> I hate to, you know, get into profanities here, but sometimes when you're dealing with skeptics, uh, they can they can be a bit frustrating that way. It, they could have, as a private company, just kind of let everything go and back down the minute they had controversy. I mean, if I was in charge, this is something that I would have done: just back down, let the controversy go away, give everybody what they wanted, except for the skeptics, and you know, take up the mantle of of being against pseudoscience later on, more quietly, when you don't have a great big uh, controversy to deal with. I mean, that that would have been the sensible thing from a business standpoint. But with the, with the skeptics behind them making a lot of noise and with them trusting the skeptics, they just kept going and going and going and going. So this whole thing dragged out for about a month and a half uh, with the uh, TEDx um, Hollywood thing sort of being the big thing that blew it all up into something even bigger. I mean, it's like they were trying for negative publicity. They, if they had, if they had actively sought out that negative publicity, they could not have done a better job of it. 
Now, you've used the word skeptics quite a bit, and I think I've used it myself. But I think uh, the particular people that we're referring to who want to ban certain speakers from TED and remove material from Wikipedia, while they call themselves skeptics, they uh, don't seem to be behaving uh uh, according to the normal principles of philosophical skepticism. And, and I think you write about that as well. Absolutely. Uh, this is something that I've observed myself. And I was helped by a 2013 study from the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, if I remember correctly. They've identified several different types of skeptics, uh, not skeptics, uh, atheists. Now, an important thing to know about skeptics is that when you're talking about skeptics, atheists. Atheists, skeptics, skeptics, atheists. Same thing. Skeptics are always atheists. So when you know that part, then you can move on to what kind of atheist they are. And they are an anti-theist. They, they comprise about 15% of atheists. And anti-theists are, of course, the Richard Dawkins of the world. These are the people that are bashing religion and consider it infantile and make references to the sky daddy and all this other insulting stuff. I, I personally think that skeptics are a subcategory of anti-theists and they represent the fundamentalists of atheism because boy, do they act like it. In, um, and you particularly see this on, uh, Wikipedia, which is the one place where Skeptics don't have to worry about any repercussions for how they act. So you see some of the most terrible skeptical behavior, including retribution uh, on Wikipedia. So yes, these are zealots. There, there isn't much difference between them and religious zealots. Uh, and when you look at other fundamentalist areas, like when you're talking about the super, super conservatives, um, or the people who are like totally off the deep end on the liberals, same thing. They're, the behavior is nearly identical. Well, let's talk about Wikipedia and uh, why is it the case that uh, these anti-theists, as you characterize them, can uh, operate on Wikipedia without any concern for re repercussions? Well, Wikipedia started out as a very open and welcoming platform when it first uh, began. And then slowly over time, they, Wikipedia went from being inclusionist to exclusionist. Uh, and what that means is that instead of saying, yeah, why not another article? They started picking and choosing about which articles they would accept and being far, far more picky about it. And this was really the introduction of uh, authoritarian zealot personality types slowly tar starting to take it over. Uh, they are aggressive. They're insulting. They are intolerant. And when you start get, when you start getting more and more of these people, you begin to develop a culture that favors their point of view. Now, in the case of Wikipedia, when we're talking about subjects like parapsychology or any of these medical practices that we've been referring to, this is an area where the zealots have completely taken charge. And when they're not just the editors, but also the moderators and the uh, the administrators, then they're basically controlling every aspect of that portion of Wikipedia. And at that point, nothing gets past them, literally nothing. If you try to edit in these areas, what you'll what you'll be faced with is opposition, and it does not matter at all whether you have any sort of grounding, whether you can provide citations, anything like that because it's just simply about power and they have a lot more of it than you do. So whatever they feel needs to be on that Wikipedia, Wikipedia page is what goes there. And when I ran into that, it was like, oh God, these guys, holy smokes. No, nope, not doing this. And I backed off and I stopped trying to do that and just uh, reported on the sidelines when I watched, uh, when I watched the uh, uh, several people actually try to help improve Rupert Sheldrake's page. That was a complete disaster. Everybody got banned in the end. 
Well, I've had my own uh, issues with Wikipedia, as I referred to earlier. Many years ago, somebody posted an article about me and mentioned that I happened to have a doctoral diploma in parapsychology. And uh, some editor uh, took it upon themselves to say, no, that's impossible. He doesn't really, he's lying about his doctoral diploma. So they took the uh, article about me down. It has never reappeared. But uh, I don't consider Wikipedia, you know, to be the final authority on anything. Uh, right now, the Society for Psychical Research in England has their own Psy Encyclopedia that's online, uh, which which they control. So uh, I think it's fair-minded. And uh, there, there's plenty of outlets where this material gets into the internet, such as the New Thinking Aloud channel that you are on right at this moment. So uh, to me, it's not a serious problem. But for people who consider Wikipedia to be as authoritative as, let us say, the Encyclopedia Britannica, that then it is a problem. You have to realize uh, that a lot of Wikipedia's respectability comes from search engines. Uh, this is the main problem you have with when you're dealing with misinformation on Wikipedia, is it gets everywhere. So when you're doing a quick search on something and this little Google pop-up thing shows up that has a brief explanation, it's probably from Wikipedia. And if you ask Alexa, it's probably, the answer is probably coming from Wikipedia. Uh, and you have all these other sources that are relying on this completely junky source of information for a wide variety of topics because it's free. And it doesn't cost them anything. If they were trying to use Encyclopedia Britannica, that would cost them money. And you can't, I, I don't think it's realistic to expect search engines to go look for a better source because why? That would cost them money. Well, as I recall, uh, Craig, the uh, skeptics, uh, or I'll call them pseudo-skeptics, actually, uh, to me, a, a true skeptic is first and foremost skeptical of themselves. But in, in any case, they have what I believe it's called the Rational Wiki, which is a, a, a separate Wikipedia just uh, espousing their point of view. And uh, if I recall correctly from our previous conversation, they've targeted you. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you look up my name on on a Google search engine, on the first page somewhere, you will find a, ra a rational wiki entry on me. And according to them, I can, I'm a conspiracy theorist, uh, your basic wackadoodle, uh, type that, um, that peddles pseudoscience. You know, the usual thing that skeptics, uh, feel about people they disagree with. Uh, I haven't engaged that page at all. Uh, the only way to, to work with that sort of situation is to just not do anything. The more you engage, the worse they'll make that page. Uh, there was another person who worked on Wikipedia. His name was Rome Viharo. And if you look at his rac his rational Wikipedia biography, what you'll see is that it just got bigger. It just got more and more lies about the guy uh, until finally it was like almost two pages of, of information about him that, that was, you know, basically, what, what is going on here with this article? If you look at it, that, that would be your question. It's like, what? Uh, and because mine is short, uh, and relatively slanderous, it's, it's not as bad. You know, people, people look at this and they go, what? And then they move on to something else. The shorter, the better. You brought up the issue of conspiracy theories, and it, it strikes me that uh, on the New Thinking Aloud channel, I see a number of viewers who post comments indicating that they subscribe to different conspiracy theories. And I, I think a number of people feel that because uh, there's so much uh, scientific evidence and personal experience, two-thirds of the population, I believe, report having had the, the kinds of experiences that parapsychologists study, uh, that, that people are distrustful of 
uh, mainstream media sources of, of all kinds, because I think they figure if they're suppressing this field, who knows what else they're suppressing. And so, uh, a lot of areas that uh, don't have the same kind of um, rigorous and lengthy history that parapsychology has uh, get lumped together as, uh, as fringe areas that deserve credibility. Uh, how, how do you evaluate them? How does one distinguish between uh, work in parapsychology and, and uh, claims of a, a wide variety of other theories? Well, first of all, to deal with the, the media part, um, this is actually an area of great interest to me because, because I've studied the skeptics so much, I've also seen the reactions to the skeptics. And when you, when you take the skeptic point of view of things, and one of them is we can't possibly have any information that does not support our point of view. So we're going to leave out everything that supports the other point of view. That, that is what will generate conspiracy theories and cause people to go nuts online because they compare a different source to what they see in the mainstream media and they see that these are different because the mainstream media is afraid to advocate for something that they're afraid is wrong. So they're leaving out this information. Other people pick up this information. They decide it's all a big conspiracy and off they run. Um, I, I've, I've seen this with, with a number of things. I'm fairly convinced that uh, the the way that we've handled the anti-vax movement has made it bigger. Uh, but that that's just that's just one of them. There are other areas where where I've seen the conspiracy theories grow as a result of having something to push against uh, because of how skeptics deal with controversy. In other words, by uh, sh trying to shut these things down, anything that uh, has the appearance of being suppressed is going to attract people to it for that very reason. I think so, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about parapsychology, this is an entirely different animal, as you said, because people are having their own experiences, and then they're comparing that with what they what they see online. Uh, uh, in... So just to let you know, I'm on Quora, which is a question and answer site, and I get a chance to see the views of a lot of people from various backgrounds. So I'm getting a better look at the general public. And what I see is that when people have these paranormal experiences and then they, they and then they read online or they re, or they see in the new in the news that there is no evidence for it, their conclusion is, "Oh, this is beyond science." That's their conclusion. This is beyond science. It's a mystery that science can't solve. It's a mystery that science, um, it's a mystery where science fails. It's wrong, but that's the conclusion that they draw because they're not getting the correct information. So they end up, uh, instead of embracing science, because science, Instead of embracing science, science isn't matching what they actually experience, so they embrace something else that matches their experience. The, the skeptics are getting exactly the opposite effect of what they're trying to achieve. Do you think that there are certain views that ought not to be uh, given any credibility at all, that ought to be suppressed? For example, racist views or uh, uh, views regarding certain religious groups or, or views that there is a, a secret elite who are uh, controlling everything or that Bill Gates wants to implant computer chips in everybody uh, you, through some sort of vaccine he's promoting. Uh, aren't there some views that are just beyond the pale that uh, because, let's say, parapsychology is unfairly suppressed, uh, people are giving these views more credence than they ought to? That's a good question. I, I I don't know if parapsychology has anything to do with these other views. Uh, but uh, from, and this is just my personal opinion, when we're talking about the stuff that's actually very, very harmful to people, like uh, races, you know, developing, developing uh, racist organizations and, uh, uh, basically making race relation, race relations worse, uh, that sort of thing. I think it depends on the forum. If you're talk, if you're giving these people a forum for talking where they don't 
have opposing viewpoints, they are very dangerous. But if they are forced to compete with other views, then I think you have a much more healthy situation. For example, what I, what I see on Quora is that you have these, these wackadoodle views on the one hand, and then you have several views that people can see all at once. They see all the views together so that people have it. So your average person has a chance to compare. And these people pushing those views have to converse or interact with people they disagree with all the time. And I think that produces a healthy situation. It's only when you have a forum where they don't have to deal with any criticism or any backlash from their views that you end up with a situation where they start getting on a roll. Because unless you have opposing facts, people really can't, they can't balance it out. I think that's a very healthy attitude. Uh, I'm kind of uh, inclined to uh, agree with you. I know the philosopher Karl Popper once said that uh, if if we believe in tolerance, then we must be intolerant of those who are intolerant. And it, it struck me that there's got to be a gray area there. It does seem to me that really virulent anti-Semitism or virulent racism, uh, there can be no tolerance for that. But uh, there are other forms uh, of it, sort of soft forms of racism and, and anti-Semitism where the, to try and suppress it uh, is only going to make things worse. And that uh, probably the, the better course is, as you say, let's have an open discussion. Yeah. I mean, if, if it were me, what's more, what's more effective in, in my opinion, uh, a situation where we simply remove all the racism or a situation where we have, where we show the racism and then we show the response to it. And, and the response includes an explanation about why this racism doesn't work and where all of the points that the racists, racists, all of the points that the racists are bringing up uh, are challenged and constantly being challenged is the way that people develop critical thinking skills. When you have all of the different points of view that you to work with and you, you have to make a decision based on an ambiguous situation, not simply having the facts spoon fed to you. This is, I think, a, a fault of mainstream media is spoon feeding. If you shut out all of this racism and don't put it in context, you just say racism is, racism is bad, you're, you're kind of giving them a space to push, you're kind of giving them something to push against, which I don't think is helpful. Well, of course, racism raises a, a enormous controversies because of its societal implications and because of the damage uh, historically that it has caused. But let's take something maybe somewhat more neutral. I know there are active proponents of the flat earth theory on on the internet and a lot of people feel uh, i think for good reason but one might argue that uh, that theory has no credibility whatsoever and 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 doesn't deserve to be on uh, a, a forum like the ted talks or wikipedia uh, that purports to be uh, presenting the truth how how do you view the flat earth Personally, I review the flat earth uh, theory as so completely ridiculous that it, it performs a service for science by simply being out there. It's, it's the same issue. Let people have their arguments for flat earth. Let's hear them out and let's see the arguments against it and allow people to figure out that flat earth is completely ridiculous. One of the best things I've seen online is showing what the flat earth would look like as the earth passes by the moon, which it would look like a pizza going by, which of course we never see, you know, we don't see a pizza going by the moon. We see, you know, we see a sphere and um, there are, there are all kinds of other examples that you can use to show how ridiculous flat earth is. But in, unless people see the flat earth ideas next to the reasons why they're ridiculous, again, you're not using your thinking skills. You're not putting, you're not getting people to use their critical thinking skills. You're just telling them this is what you should believe, which I don't think, I don't think that's effective. 
Craig Weiler, this has been a stimulating conversation. I very much appreciate your perspective. You uh, uh, have given me some food for thought because I occasionally do delete comments on, on the New Thinking Aloud channel when, when people uh, post uh, various conspiracy theories. And uh, maybe I've been a little too aggressive about that. I might uh, I do it because sometimes I think they're irrelevant to the point at hand or they strike me as, as somebody's trying to proselytize uh, almost for their religion. But I, I think I'm going to be a little more liberal in, in my policies about uh, comments on the New Thinking Aloud channel uh, as a result of having had this conversation with you. So thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. And for those of you viewing, thank you for being with us.